much to the choir, all you guys. Uh, thank you. Well, it's Easter, so you know what that means. You can now wear white pants. <laughs> now, some of you might not have gotten that, um, so just for, so that we're all on the same page, you, you might not be aware of this, and I don't know exactly when it started or who first created these, but fashion rules were at some point developed. And among the rules of fashion, they state that you don't wear white pants, or for that matter, white shoes, until Easter. And then you can wear them until Labor Day, but then after that, you put them back in the closet until next Easter. So th those are the rules. And I got to thinking about that, and I, I wondered, first of all, who gets to make up those rules? I mean, was it Joan Rivers? Was it, I don't know, was it one of the Kardashians? Was it the Wizard of Oz? I don't know who, who gets to say, this is the rule for everybody. I don't know. Beyond that, on what basis did they say that? And the, the best I could come up with is that white fabric is bright, and so spring, summer, those in the natural world, those are brighter seasons with things being in bloom, so it, it makes sense to kind of wear bright clothes in keeping with what's going on when you get into fall and the winter. Yeah, put away the, the bright stuff. I, 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 guess, I guess that's why it is. I don't know. Because it's Easter, you can wear white pants. All of that led me to, to, to think this thought and to pose to you a fill-in-the-blank statement. Now, I don't want you to, to answer out loud, but I want you to come up with an answer in your mind. All right? Because it is Easter, I can fill in the blank. Because it's Easter, I can fill in the blank. Now, th there's lots of things that you may be filling the blank in with. You may say, because it's Easter, I can wear white pants or white shoes. You may say, because it's Easter, I can dye eggs or hide eggs. You may say, because it's, it's Easter, and I don't know why you would do this, but you could say, I can eat peeps. I don't, again, I don't know why you would do that. You could say, because it's Easter, I can have a honey-baked ham for lunch. All sorts of things that you can fill in that blank with. All sorts of different ways that you can answer that question when Easter is an occasion. All sorts of ways that you can fill in that blank if and when Easter is an occasion. But I want to ask you this question. What if Easter is more than that? What if instead of an occasion, Easter is a reality? And... What, what does reality mean? I think A.W. Tozer said it best when he described this. A reality is something that has existence apart from any ideas that anyone has about them. That which is a reality does not depend on an observer's recognition for its validity. It's how things actually are. If Easter is an occasion, then you get to do some things. And Easter means I can do some things that I've been wanting to do for a while. If, however, Easter is bigger than that, if it's different than that, if it's a reality, then maybe my response of necessity should be a bit different. Well, in, in what way? Look with me in your Bibles today to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we're going to deal with this text this morning in a, in a little more different fashion than I, I normally would. And I'll just let you in on my game plan. We're going to walk through a series of verses. And then I want to zero in on one verse. And I'll give you one thought to think. So we should be done in, what, five minutes? <laughs> First Corinthians 15. Paul begins this chapter, and obviously, he's writing to a group of believers in the city of Corinth, hence Corinthians. And out of the gate, he starts in verse 1, and he says, I declare to you the gospel. So I, I'm writing to you the gospel. And he says that, that I first preached to you. So when I actually came to Corinth and was preaching there, I shared with you the gospel. You received it, and it's on this gospel that you stand. It's what your faith is built on. 
And then in the verses that follow, he begins to unpack some of the facts of the gospel. He says, first of all, in verse 3, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he goes on to describe all the individuals that saw the resurrected Christ, including in excess of 500 people. Peter, James, John, even Paul says, I saw him. These are the facts of the gospel. By the time you get to verse 12, though, he's, he's changing focus. All of these facts that he's described, Paul is aware that there is a singular linchpin to them. He says, this is the gospel. This is what I shared with you in person. It's what I'm writing to you about again now. The linchpin to all of this is the resurrection of Christ. And in verse 12, he says this, and is alluding to a challenge that the Corinthians were facing. And what clearly was going on is that some folks have become a part of the church family there. And as they made their way into the church, they brought in some ideas and began to espouse some views that, that, that weren't actually correct. In fact, quite frankly, were very damaging. And in short, what they were saying is that there is, in fact, no resurrection from the dead. So you have this life, however many days or years that you have. You have this life, and when this life is over, when you breathe your last, the bucket is kicked, the curtains are closed, the lights go out, and that's it. And so Paul says in verse 12, If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? So he said, listen, I just went over with you the facts of the gospel, the linchpin of which is the resurrection of Christ. Yet there are people that are a part of this church that are telling you, and many of you are starting to buy into this, that there is, in fact, only this life. That's it. There is no resurrection from the dead. And Paul's point, as he builds on that, starting in verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. I mean, if, if Christ could not overcome death, then there's no way that I am and there's no way that you are. There's no resurrection of anyone. We are hopeless. And he says, and if Christ is not risen, then first of all, he says, our preaching, all the stuff I'm saying to you, it's empty. It is void of anything of meaningful content. Beyond that, he says, your faith is empty. Nothing of meaningful content. Furthermore, he says, we are found false witnesses of God. We're lying about God. And then he says, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are, I am, we are still in our sins. And if that's the case in verse 19, it means the only hope that we have concerning Jesus is just while we're here in this life. And if this is the only time for which there is hope concerning Jesus, well, to... Uh, among all men, among all people on the face of the earth, we are to be pitied the most. By the time you get to verse 20, he's back on target. And he's saying, in short, all this has been to, to reason with you, to deduce with you. But Christ is risen because there is a resurrection from the dead and he's the first fruits of it. He's the proof of this. And beyond that, he describes how there is going to be, and those who follow Christ have an expectant hope that one day this one who is risen from the dead is going to make right all that sin made wrong. And one day there is going to be the death of death, and Christ is going to reign over all. So th th there's his argument. All that leads us up to verse 29. Everything I've said thus far has just been kind of preparatory because of what Paul is getting ready to say. He's laying the groundwork, he's laying the foundation for what he says beginning with verse 29. By the time you get, though, to verse 32, he says this. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. Well, what's he talking about there? If I fought with beasts at Ephesus. Well, you're probably aware from, even if you weren't a great history student, aware of the fact that the Romans were and still are very much considered among ancient cultures to be very advanced. And they had been able to come up with all sorts of 
pretty impressive technology for the limitations of the day. And their understanding of, of physics and of science and of medicine for the day, it was quite astounding. And though they, they were in so many ways an enlightened culture, they were still very much a barbaric and violent culture. Where among other things, the, the, for sheer sport and for the entertainment of the masses, prisoners would be dumped into the field of an enormous arena seating thousands of people and people would come in and cheer and watch and laugh and yell and scream and love it as they watch a prisoner fight for his life against an angry wild animal. So Paul says, if I were to fight wild beasts in Ephesus, that's what he's talking about. And his point very simply is this. If because of my commitment to Christ, I were to be imprisoned and then tossed to the lions in an open amphitheater, if I were to suffer an excruciating, horrible death like that for the sake of Christ, if he is not risen, not only have I wasted my time, I've wasted my life. I've done this for no benefit, for no good cause. If there is, in fact, no resurrection, in particular, no resurrection of Christ, this should be my life's motto. You see it at the end of verse 32. Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we will die. So if there is no resurrection of Christ, and if there is no resurrection, then let's live it up now. Because to suffer, to, to, to undergo and to experience discipline, to do all of these things, it is meaningful, it is useless, it is futile, it is worthless if he's not risen. I'm wasting my time. Just the other week, I was giving some thought uh, to going out and washing my car. And that, that's not fun. I don't enjoy that on any day. And it's a lot of trouble to get the hose and the bucket and all this stuff out and to clean it and do all this mess, put all that stuff back up. And I was thinking about doing that. And I got my phone out and I opened the little Weather Channel app and it said, there's a 40% chance of rain later today. Now, you know that if you wash your car, that goes from 40% to 100%, right? Right? So I thought, well, I'm not going to do that. Why do all of that stuff if it's just going to get dirty as soon as it rains? Instead of doing all of that, why don't I just do something I would much rather enjoy? If, if there's to be no be benefit, why go to all that trouble? Let me do something else that I would enjoy much more. That's the argument that Paul is making here. If Christ did not rise, if there is no resurrection, if this life is in fact all that we have, we absolutely might as well live it up. After all, it could be lights out tomorrow. Why deny myself any pleasure? Why when the waiter comes by and says, would you like dessert? Why would I say no? This could be my last meal. Let me eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. Maybe, just maybe, it could be it. Tomorrow we may die. Now that, that's an awful lot to lead us to this point, so hopefully you're prepared for this. If Easter, instead of being proof that this life is not all that is, if instead of that it's just an occasion, if Easter is just a date on a calendar then I emphatically, you and everyone should emphatically do whatever they want. We should be making the most of life and absolutely living it up. My time should be focused and your time should be focused on doing what you want to do and whatever makes you happy. Your body and my body should become a repository of pleasure and that I intentionally pursue and only experience the things that make me happy and make me feel good. And relative to the relationships that I have with others, the only relationships that I should ever have to deal with and the only relationships I should experience should be those that are with people that make me happy, that make me feel good, that make me feel loved, valued, and appreciated. And if such time it gets to a point where I have to work through difficult seasons Seasons, if I have to work to make that relationship work, well, can it because life's too short? If Easter is just an occasion, life is too short, let's live this thing up. Do what you want. 
If it feels good, do that. If you want to do something, then just do it. If, in fact, Easter is an occasion. If it's just an occasion, get out your white pants. Boil some eggs. Eat some peeps. Get that fake grass stuck in all your crevices of your home. Do whatever you want. If Easter is just an occasion... Certainly people in our country are aware that today is Easter, regardless of their religious affiliation or lack thereof. And so whether someone professes to be a devoted follower of some particular religion, Christian or otherwise, or whether they profess to be an ardent, avid atheist, people throughout America, unless they are an ostrich and have their head in the sand, they're aware that today is Easter. They know that. In fact, of the seven plus billion people on the face of the earth, in the developed countries of the world, the vast majority of this planet, regardless of the religious affiliation or lack thereof, people are aware that today is Easter. They know that. And for the vast majority, for the overwhelming majority, not simply of people in the United States, but of people around the world, Recognizing that this is Easter is a testament to the fact Easter is an occasion. It's an occasion, a calendar event. But what if it's more? What if it's more? My hope is that you're here today because you understand that and believe that Easter is more than an occasion. That the resurrection of Jesus is more than a date you can circle on a calendar hanging on the wall. What if instead of that, Easter is a reality? What if Easter is exactly what this book says that it is? The resurrection of Jesus. The one who actually and literally died. And actually, literally, and physically rose again. If that is, in fact, a reality, it is a significant reality. A reality that may want me to do something more and demand of me something more than wearing white pants or hiding some boiled eggs. Paul gives us the response. You see it in verse 34. If Jesus is alive... If Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, is more than an occasion, if it is a reality, then I must, Paul says, wake from my stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. You say, well, Michael, I, I don't quite get where you're going. So let me put the pieces of the puzzle together. It's a pretty simple puzzle. Paul is writing to a group of people who have been affected by outsiders who have come into the church with some bad doctrine, and they've been saying, you know what, it really is truly one life to live. And you'd better enjoy it because life is short. You've got a limited amount of time. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. There is this life, and that's it. And people are beginning to think, you know what, maybe there's something to that. Maybe, just maybe, these jokers are right. And bit by bit, over time, they're becoming increasingly affected by this. Paul writes this letter to step in and say, guys, time out, time out. Hold up on that. And he says, how can you say that? If there is no resurrection, then Jesus did not rise, but he did rise. And this stuff is real. And he acknowledged that you're hanging out with people who are impacting you and adversely affecting you. And he cautions them in verse 33, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. These people are having an effect on you. Don't kid yourself. You run with skunks, eventually you stink, and you guys are starting to smell kind of foul. And so he says in verse 34, wake up. Wake up. It's as if you have been and you have been lulled into a stupor. If the resurrection of Jesus is exponentially more than an occasion, if it is a reality, then that reality of absolute necessity imposes demands on you 
that'll cause you to wake up and say, I've got to take this stuff serious. And he summarizes it this way. Do not go on sinning. If he is alive, in short, act like it. If Easter is just an occasion, do what you want. But if Easter is a reality, it means that Jesus is alive and that of necessity has to impact my life. Think about it this way. If Jesus, as the Bible presents, if it is correct... that Jesus is alive, then it means that Jesus is the only one who actually over, ever overcame death. If, if this is right, then Jesus is the only one who overcame death. Furthermore, if this is right, not only did he overcome death, but he said well before, well before, years before the crucifixion, I will rise again. If he was right about something as significant as that, it therefore stands to reason he was right about the other stuff that he said. If he was right about that, then it means he was also right when he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. It means that he was right when he demonstrated that if you and I or any want to experience life after this life is over, it's going to be found only in him. It further means that if he's right about that, he's also right when he said, these behaviors are good and right. Do those. These behaviors are wrong and bad. Do not do those. If he's right about this... He's right about everything. And if he's right about everything, and if Easter is far more than an occasion, if it's a reality, then I've got to wake up and start taking this stuff seriously. This stuff's not a game. This is not idle pablum that I am engaged in. Putting all of this together, if Jesus is, and I believe confidently that he is alive, That is a reality that of absolute necessity affects my life completely. Among other things, it means that I take Him and this living with and for Him seriously. And I live like He's alive. Martin Luther is a name that I hope you're familiar with. Uh, It's the name of a man who became the igniter for what we came to know later as the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther had been formerly a a Roman Catholic monk. And as he was studying in particular the book of Romans, came to realize that God was very clear that salvation is by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. And so as he began to write and began to speak, that very much made him an enemy and put him at odds, not only with the Roman Catholic Church, but with the Pope in particular. And this opposition that he began to experience over time became quite intense. And when you're opposed like he was, it begins to take an emotional toll on you. And his wife, Katerina, came home one day to find Martin Luther sitting in a chair, staring off in the distance in an absolute fit of despondency. He is, it's not just he's kind of having a blue day. He is in the depths of depression. She tries to talk to him and coax him and to say all the right things, but nothing that she says seems to have any effect. It's as if he's hardly even paying attention. And so finally she has an idea. She goes upstairs and she puts on a long black dress. She covers her face with a black veil looking like someone who absolutely is going to a funeral. She walks downstairs, and Martin Luther sees her descending the steps and looks over and says, Who died? She said, God is dead. Immediately, he he perks up and he says, Katerina, how in the world can you say that? It's blasphemous to say that. God is not dead. And she said very simply, Which is worse, for me to say it or for you to act like it? Can I just be honest with you for a second? I don't think there's anybody here today 
I don't think there's anybody in this room who would say, Michael, the reason I am here today is because I'm pretty doggone sure that Jesus is dead. That's, that's why I got up and that's why I left the house. That's why I showered this morning so I could come and watch people uh, and hear people as they sang and uh, open the Bible and pray and do all this stuff because I'm pretty sure that Jesus is dead. I don't think that's why you came here today. I don't believe anybody would say that that's here today. But I do believe sincerely that there's a lot who certainly are acting like it. The motto, eat, drink, and be merry, may not be the stated motto of your life, but it may very well be an accurate description. You may go to church on Easter Sunday, or for that matter, every Sunday, but when the truth is told, you are living however you want. You say what you want. You do what you want. You treat people how you like. You do everything how you want to do it. You think this world is your Burger King, and you have it your way. You do some good stuff. You do some bad stuff. If Easter is just an occasion, keep doing it. Keep doing it. In fact, if Easter is just an occasion, do whatever in the world you want to. It does not make any difference. If you want to be nice to people, you be nice to people. If you want to be crass and rude and disgruntled, then you behave and you operate that way. If you want to be honest, be honest. If you want to be dishonest, you be dishonest. You want to get drunk, get drunk. You want to do whatever you want. You want to sleep with who or whatever you want to. You do that because it does not make any difference if Easter is just an occasion. If, however, it is far more than an occasion and a reality, reality that absolutely happened, then it makes demands on my life. Then I have got to wake up. I have got to quit playing games. I have got to take this seriously. And my life has got to be different. And as Paul says, I must not go on sinning. If. If it's more than an occasion. If it's a reality. If Jesus is alive, it means that there is a God in heaven who knows what I'm doing. If Jesus is alive, it means that there's a God in heaven who's paying attention to how I'm operating. If Jesus is alive, it means that there is one who has plans and purposes for my life. If Jesus is alive, it means that there's one who has expectations on me. And if Jesus is alive, of necessity, I must be about those things. So which is it for you? If this is just an event, enjoy wearing your white pants. Dye your eggs. Use a, a white crayon on them first to put your initials on them. Do whatever you want. Melt peeps on top of your honey-baked ham. I don't care. But if this is in fact a reality, if this did happen, then you and I of necessity, if I profess to believe that, I of necessity must act like I believe it. I serve, the hymn says, a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living whatever men may say. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And when he lives within my heart, it changes everything. That's when it's a reality. Which is it for you? If Easter is just an occasion... Big deal. If Easter and the resurrection of Christ is a reality, it's a really big deal. Will you pray with me?